Howdy everybody, it's Andy Nolch here at the Nigel Farage event. I'm here filming for The Unshackled. I'm going to ask people four questions, four interesting questions. Um, and I'll get some footage from tonight and I'll piece it all together. So I hope you like it. Okay, so uh, the first question is, do you think that green energy is a scam? Absolutely. Get in close. I yeah. think it, they're trying to destroy Western culture and I think they're succeeding. All right. Uh, we all, no one wants to destroy the planet, but what's happening is a real worry. It is, actually. Yes, it is. Uh, the only people that are going to make money out of it are, are the uh, suppliers, because uh, it's always the suppliers of, of, of the metal and, and the machinery involved that are going to make money out of it. Yeah. Is green energy a scam? Yes. Yes, definitely. Why, Richard? Well, I think it's because, um, you know, basically, they want to spend money from the public purse to make our countries poorer. They want to waste as much money as possible on green energy while still using fossil fuels, which they're going to obviously price hike. So they're going to do property engineering on old fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, so that's what I think is going on there. It's uh, decimating the large bird populations of condors and eagles around the world. Absolutely and totally. Because green energy is a way that trying to stop Australia's energy independence. That we have so much natural gas beneath us. And even there's oil beneath us, but we can't dig our own oil. And we instead we rely on imports and Saudi Arabia and Russia, etc. And this is bad, terrible for our country. Uh, well, well, let's just take the electric vehicle. Would you like to do the electric vehicle? Mm -hmm. The cobalt that's mined. It's the, the, well, the, 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 uh, what is it? Something like 27 tons of iron ore that needs to be mined for each battery. Each battery they can't yeah. be recycled. And of course, they, they get charged from coal derived plants. Of course, it's a scam. And you know, and they, if they were serious, they would go nuclear. I think it's a scam. It's a left-wing idea. It's a it's a back door for socialists. Yes, definitely. Um, they've they've sold us this dream that you know solar and uh, wind energy is going to be able to provide us with um, clean, cheap power, and uh, it's just not true. I actually studied environmental science for two years, so they're you know they're feeding the dummy to all these uni students, and it's uh, it's pipe dream. So if uh, electric cars were cheap, would you buy one? Okay. Um, probably not. Probably not. I, at the moment, there's none of them that I would actually really want to buy, probably aesthetically. No, absolutely not. I've actually, I've bought Fords and Holdens all my life and it's just a shame that they don't even make them in Australia anymore. So I've been very loyal to Australia and Australian brands. Mm. If electric cars were cheap, would you buy one? No. Yeah. They will never be cheap. Yeah. No, I wouldn't get one. For one, I think we need to look at what's happening in, uh, say, like California, where people have been asked not to charge their electric cars because the power grid simply can't really? manage it. Really? Really? <laughs> really? Who would have thought? That's interesting. That's yeah. Interesting. And it's also, it's just another, like, also, you know, in Colorado as well, where the government's just, you know, they're shutting off people's cars because they, because they want to. So. Um, if we if we give that power to the government, it's only a matter of time until they decide when we can and can't go for a drive. Yeah, it's like they do like selective lockdowns for cars or something like exactly. that. Exactly, that's exactly yeah. what they're doing. If Dan Andrews wins the next election, yeah. does that mean that elections are rigged? Yes. I believe, and, and, and I've, uh, uh, in my investigations, when Dan Andrews came in the first time, the election was rigged because everybody was shocked how that guy was elected. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. And if he wins the election, then he will be having a statute, a statue built for him in Treasury Gardens, in bronze, in February. No way. Yes way. Was that like some secret inside the government or something? No. After you've been in Parliament as a leader for 3,000 days, which for Ding Dong Dan comes up in February, he will have a statue built for him. To remind us of his lengthy leadership for 3,000 days. 
Well, let's say yes, but like, you know, he might actually win of his own accord, which is a terrible, which is an even more disturbing um, reality than if it was rigged. I would prefer to think it was rigged. What are your that, thoughts, folks? If, if they vote him back in after everything he's done, then we have to accept the fact that a lot of people actually want totalitarianism. Yes. They want to be kept safe and they don't care about freedom or liberty. And we've seen that before. I mean, literally, they gave away all the all our freedoms just so they could go have a latte. Yeah. On all well, these shrines where, lest we forget, they've forgotten an instant. So it's all bullshit. COVID has actually blown away the mythology of Australia. And right now, uh, the identity of Australia and the soul of Australia is up for grabs. And Dan Andrews is selling us tyranny, and we've got to come together and sell us freedom. But if they vote for tyranny, then maybe we should move. I wouldn't say the elections are rigged. I just think that Victorians have been brainwashed. I can't really work out what it is about us. It's almost like we're not allowed to think individually and we've been brainwashed into his obsession. Oh, well, yes. Well, yes, because Victorian Labor is using state government sources and taxpayer dollars trying to rig the election and trying to stay him, help him to stay afloat. For example, the dining, 25% of dining program is one of such things. Oh, do you think he was trying to buy votes with that? Yes. They're trying to tell people that Dan Andrews care about business when the fact that he has shut down the businesses for two whole years. <laughs> uh, no, it just means Victorians are fucked in the head. <laughs> Our left is mentally ill. They are, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've got a t-shirt. Uh, liberalism is a, a mental disorder at home, which we, which I bought off the, I think the Mark Dice uh, website. They are absolutely, and I've got family members who are so infatuated with Dan Andrews and all that sort of stuff, and they ha and they've had mental health issues since they were teenagers, and and, and it just spreads absolutely, 100 percent. No, I wouldn't say they're mentally ill. I just think that uh, they want to, don't want to listen to other people's opinions. They seem to think that theirs is the only one that's valid and should be listened to, and uh, the rest of us can't think for ourselves. I think lefties are filling a void with the religion of wokeism. Yes, because lefties are, are not thinking. They're not thinking straight. What happens is that when they protest, they don't even know what they're doing. They've fallen into a cult, like thinking, a group think thinking, and uh, and uh, it's really dangerous for them because they uh, they really believe what they believe, and but uh, it's a lie. No, not across the board. That's that's unfair. Um, you know, if we were at some sort of a lefty conference, I'd be asking the same question about right wingers and going, "Oh, yeah, they've all got a mental illness." I think that's a really <laughs> juvenile kind of, you know. And I'm not saying that you take that argument. You're asking the question. I I, I don't find that a, a great way to approach this at all. Other individuals that have mental illnesses, yes, I'm on the record saying that I'm personally convinced that Daniel Andrews is a psychopath. Not in the Hollywood sense of the word, but in the genuine, if you read the encyclo def encyclopedia definition of a psychopath, I think he actually shows a lot of the symptoms. So how are you doing, mate? What, what brings you here tonight? Um, I'm always interested to, to hear from interesting people. I think Nigel Farage has been one of those remarkable and rare individuals who has kind of come from nowhere and had a pretty big impact on global politics. So uh, as someone who does try to talk about policy and try to impact global politics and Australian politics especially, uh, that's always interesting. Nice. And uh, how's your battlefield Melbourne gone? Is that what it's called? Battle ba Melbourne? Battlefield. Uh, sorry, battle... Battleground, Battleground right? Melbourne. Even I get it mixed up. Goodness. Uh, no, Battleground Melbourne's gone really well. We've had we've had uh, close to a million views now online across all the different platforms and all the different versions. There's a few different versions now. Um, we've had over 1,200 people have watched it now in cinemas, uh, and that wasn't part of the original plan. But people asked to see it in cinemas, and so I sort of put it forward and said, okay, I'll I'll organise one, and then I had to organise another and another and another. But the, the biggest thing that I'm hearing back from people and the thing that means the most to me, to be honest, is people are telling me how much it's helped them to process what they've been through over the last couple of years. Uh, and sitting in that cinema, sitting in that room with other like-minded people, I think is doing a lot of people a world of good. Uh, it's kind of like a therapy session. You know? well, there she was, saying goodbye to Boris, welcoming in her 15th Prime Minister, doing her constitutional duty to the end. And I must admit, when the news came out at half six that she died, I must admit, I shed a tear, and I think many around the world did. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I was due live on GB News at 7 o'clock. I wondered how I'd manage to hold myself together. And I thought, well, I'll do what the Queen would do in these circumstances, which is to drink two very stiff gins <laughs> and keep myself composed. And isn't it marvellous? The Queen's drink was gin and jubonne. And now every supermarket in Britain has sold out of jubonne and gin's going out quickly as well. We're drinking gin and jubonne. And Charles, well, when he was Prince Charles, <laughs> um, I had a bit of difficulty with him. <laughs> he turned up in the European Parliament one day and gave a speech saying the EU needs more power. The North Pole will be gone within seven years. It's all going to be a disaster. And at the end of his speech, oh, they stood and they applauded, but I sat there with my arms crossed, which led to much comment in the British press. The next time I saw him was another event he was speaking at, and he came to see me before. He said, oh, Nigel, I'm really sorry. You're absolutely going to hate it today. <laughs> which at least shows a sense of humour. Indeed, Brexit and Trump would never have happened without YouTube and Twitter. And yet now, those same social media giants are doing everything they can do to ban or shadow ban or suppress anybody expressing a conservative view. Much the same can be said of vast waves of social media. But for the first time ever, this now extends into the corporate world as well. Banks, giant companies, you know, putting their staff through the most bizarre forms of diversity training, supporting all sorts of political campaigns, cancelling, effectively cancelling radio and TV presenters by withdrawing their advertising. Our rights of free speech are very much under threat and it's happening from within. We're doing it to ourselves. That's why it's very important we've got people like Getter, Jason here today. There are new platforms springing up that will be genuine free speech platforms. You've got Sky News in Australia. We've now got GB News in the UK. There are means by which we can fight back. But we must understand that free speech is under attack. Our Judeo-Christian culture is under attack. 